So it was me, Kevin, and Hugh Jackman go to this restaurant at the Four Seasons in Toronto. And I remember turning to Kevin after Hugh left. He went upstairs to his room and I said, are you thinking what I'm thinking? And he's like, yeah. And I said, this is the guy. But I see in you, like I said before, a lot mm -hmm. of the same things that I saw in Hugh Jackman when he walked in the door. If I was going to go to Hasbro and say, all right, here are the designs for a Hollywood leading man. Could you just put this in the computer and make a bunch of action figures? They would look like you and you, Jack. <laughs> Welcome back to the Fode Philosophy. I am your host, Pearson Fode. I also have my guest host, Mark Doner. I'm here. <sighs> Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for tuning in. And that's the entire podcast. <laughs> Farewell. <laughs> no, 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 no. Enjoy your Adderall. <laughs> <laughs> I have one of my heroes, my mentors, and one of my best friends, Tom DeSanto. How are you, bro? I am good, Pearson Fode. Yes. Congrats on all of your success. Thank you. And your future success, which is going to blow away your current success. I, so, I actually completely agree. Yes, I am known as Nostra Dumbass. So <laughs> I'm just known as co host. It's okay. You are a co host. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're working on your music. Great. Yeah, Enough no. about me. No. Then, come on. Mark, tell us about Threesome. How many Threesome's, threesomes charting in Norway. Shout out, Norway. Yeah, what up, Norway? How's it, do how's Nor it doing in Norway Canada? loves the Threesomes. They do. The they do. They do yeah. yeah. That's why they have the higher happiness quotient that the United <laughs> States does. <laughs> now, Tom, I actually want to ask you a couple questions because shoot for those of you guys that don't know, Tom made us a, a couple of like small, independent, very small films. You mm -hmm. probably have never heard of like X-Men and Transformers and Battlestar Galactica and, you know, a few other small indie projects. Again, mm. you probably have never heard of these giant franchises. <laughs> yes. All of my action figures have paid my mortgage many times over. Uh -huh. So um, if you have a dream, go for it. Even though it may become a nightmare for a little while, the dream can come true. I am living proof of that. So what was your, what was your gateway into Hollywood? Like, why did you want to make movies? Why did you want to write? Why did you want to produce? Also, when you say make movies, what does that entail? What is your job description? So mm -hmm. the people know, um, so the producer generally is the first person there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like they're the person who will be the person who has the idea. They will, uh, either write it themselves or they find a writer. They put together, uh, the package, they will bring it to the studio with a director either attached or not attached, but they're the person who's sort of there first and also the last one to leave. So, so they're basically the like, hey, I want to make a movie yeah, about like, this and they put it all together. Yeah. So for me, X-Men was a movie I wanted to make since I was probably about 10 years old. You know, I was that kid rushing home from football practice to play Dungeons and Dragons. And, um, you know, I probably own right now about 40,000 comic books. So Jesus. he has a whole room. It's probably one of the coolest rooms you'll ever walk in with comic books. Small obsession. Small obsession. Small obsession. <laughs> very, yeah. very small very, obsession. Yes. Very big hands. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, it's one of those things when, when I realized, like, I was always like doing stories as a kid and I started out drawing and I started like, like my mom said that, um, when I was three, I threw myself on the ground of like a 7-Eleven and she wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't uh, let her pick me up. I went, you know that kids go dead weight. They're just like, uh, mm -hmm. I'm just going to make you. <laughs> yeah. Parents like, oh, I can't. You're too heavy for me to pick up anymore until she bought me a comic book. And I couldn't even mm -hmm. read. But what I was really entranced with were, were, were the images. And um, what you realize is when you look at a comic book, a comic book is basically a storyboard for a film. So it's teaching you visual storytelling. And I know there's a lot of filmmakers who badmouth uh, comic books, but if we were in ancient Greece, we would be telling stories, kids about Hercules and his arrogance, and how he needed to learn humility through the labors. So if done right, and when done crappy, they could be really bad movies, um, like Transformers 5. We all apologize for that. But <laughs> when they're done properly, like Transformers 1, or X-Men 1, you know, we opened X-Men 1 in Auschwitz. And there's a responsibility, I think, for artists. And we, there was a lot of resistance to opening a comic book movie, a superhero movie, in a concentration camp. But it was really showing that when he, one part of humanity demonizes another part of humanity, what humanity is capable of. And that's why I think, you know, Ian's character of Magneto is so interesting because you understand, you know, he sees the ghosts of this happening again and he's not going to let it happen. So that was part of the reason that I really fell in love with X-Men and, um, 
you know, when I went after the rights, you know, Marvel was bankrupt. Uh, comic book movies were dying at the box office, but it took four years from the time I wrote the treatment until we were in theaters. Um, mm -hmm. And it's still the, the best filmmaking experience of my life. That's crazy. I mean, with everything I do, it's like such a quick turnaround that to imagine four years on a, like a video in my, like, you know, yeah. it's obviously a movie that's gotta be some ded dedication oh, yeah. like to spend four years on one project. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, we got shut down. Uh, we had to cut $20 million out of the budget. There was a bunch of, you know, hurdles. And the one thing that I think is more important than even talent is tenacity. Like if you do not give up, if you find a way to do it, if you just keep pushing forward and your job as a storyteller, whether it's a filmmaker or a musician, is you have to instill your passion for that piece of music in other people. And for me, it was trying to instill my passion for comic books and what they could be in, an, in that first X-Men film. What did, what did comic, comic books provide for you as a kid? You know, uh, we were five people in four rooms until I was 10. Mm -hmm. You know, my dad was a cop uh, in Elizabeth, New Jersey. We were very blue collar, you know, um, but it was me and my two brothers in uh, one room and it was a boxcar apartment. So anyone who grows up on the East Coast, there's just like four rooms together. Um, and it allowed me to, you know, when you're a kid, mm -hmm. you get this thing of, you want to change the world. You have this like pure heart, but you can't because mm -hmm. you're sort of helpless. But what superheroes do is they give you this ability to take your shoes off and put their shoes on. Mm -hmm. And what if you could, you know, become Superman or, you know, you know, when you're a little kid, like, oh man, if my parents got killed and I had a butler and I had millions of dollars, like everybody, every guy and a lot of girls deep down yeah. think, yeah, I could be Batman. Mm -hmm. Um, and it appeals to our better nature. You know, these are the things that they don't do things uh, that they could abuse their power. Like Superman could be the most evil creature on the planet. Mm -hmm. But there's an angelic quality about that character that I don't think even the movies really understand that makes him the best aspect of what humans can be. Yeah. Was he one of your idols growing up inside of the comic book world? Or what was one of your favorite characters that you connected with the most? Yeah, for me, it was that first Richard Donner Superman movie, mm. you know? Yeah. And, um, you know, to any Gen Xer, our Power Rangers were old reruns of the Batman TV show from the 60s. So um, whereas, you know, millennials would come home from school and then punch their brothers after watching Power Rangers. Hell yeah. Uh, Gen Xers <laughs> would do that watching old reruns of Batman. Yeah. Um, and you just beat the crap out of each other. Um, but with Superman, when Chris, Christopher Reeve's performance still is that seminal performance, mm -hmm. you know, you know, 40 plus years later. Yeah. Because he understood the soul of that character. Mm. Do Why you do you think it was because he was that character in a lot of ways? Like, do you think what we're missing in the modern Superman's is, they, is they've gone darker? I think there is a big push towards darkness. I noticed it right after 9-11. You know, yeah. there was a big seismic shift in art. And certain characters can go dark. But, you know, it's, it's, it's also you need hope. Yeah. You know, and I think there was a big flaw in... And when I saw those first two trailers for Man of Steel with the speeches from Costner and... Um, um, Oh my God, Russell who played Jorel? Russell Crowe. I'm yeah. like, oh, they knocked, they got it. Yeah. And then I was in that midnight screening at the Cinerama Dome because I'm a fan with the real fans. And when Superman snapped Zod's neck, mm -hmm. you heard people hissing at the screen. Yeah. And that is a failure in understanding the character. You not change Superman to fit the times. You make the times remember why Superman is important. Mm. And they tried to change Superman to fit. Oh, everybody's dark. Everybody's like, you know, we're in, uh, we're in the Middle East. There's war. Sometimes you need to kill. No. How awesome would it have been in that movie if he's using his heat vision and he's about to kill that kid in that family? And if Superman just said, because he challenges him, he says, you, you're going to kill me or I'm going to kill you. And if he had just said, I'm not going to kill you. And if he just flown up through that ceiling the audience would have fell in, fallen in love with Superman. Yeah. But instead, you had this, you know, giant 
uh, malaise around the character. Mm -hmm. um, and I know friends who produce toys for that character. And there's a bunch of Superman toys that didn't get sold um, that ended up in a landfill. Yeah. And, you know, there's a soul to that character that's important. Mm -hmm. uh, and speaking of which, thank you for embodying that soul in the awesome you know, heroes wear masks. And I know we're going to get that to that down the, the line, but yeah. you know, you really captured that energy of that character. Oh, thank you. Which is aspirational and angelic. And if only that person really existed. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you for doing that because, uh, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things that when your fellow human beings see that short film you did, mm -hmm. um, it changes hearts and minds. Yeah. For those of you that don't know what uh, Tom's talking about, and Tom had reached out to me to do a campaign along with a bunch of his other friends uh, in the film industry. And it was called Heroes Wear Masks. And I'll let you like kind of dive into that. But it was <laughs> essentially Tom had pitched the idea. He was like, be a hero, a hero that you would look up to kind of put that out in the ether and allow that to be the thing that changes hearts through inspiration rather than fear. And so I sat down and I wrote a quick little monologue and then I wrote a storyboard to it, kind of Superman-esque. And I think, you know, between Tyler and I, I think we really captured that vision with your redirection on some of the monologue and images that we put in. Yeah, I, I, I could not have been more proud of you for Thank what you. you were able to accomplish. And, yeah. um, you know, look, it, it, everyone's exhausted. Yes, we need to wear masks. And it, 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 we understand it becomes like Groundhog Day. But... Mm -hmm. Um, the message still is not getting through to some people. Yeah. Why do you and think that is? I think it's um, a couple of things. I think the, the primary thing is I think people are afraid to appear weak. Mm -hmm. And it is the opposite of weak when you wear a mask. Because you wear that mask. The mask only protects you a certain percentage. What the mask really does, it protects all the people around you. So it protects your classmates, it protects your grandmother, it mm -hmm. protects your family, your friends, strangers, mm -hmm. you know? So all these people who are like, you know, I'm not gonna be a pussy, I'm not gonna wear a mask, you know, you're wrong. Mm -hmm. Educate yourself, you're smarter than this. Yeah. You know, there's a reason that Japan is kicking our ass right now in terms of, and we have a lot to learn from Japan. Japan has about 1,200 people dead. Mm -hmm. They have, 2.9% unemployment, and they've had no economic shutdown. Hmm. Why? Because guess what? In 1918, they all realized during the Spanish influenza that every time someone is sick, they put on a mask. Mm -hmm. So in Asia, you put on a mask when you're feeling ill. You don't put it on to protect yourself. You're protecting other people. Yeah. And if we had done that, comparatively, we would probably be between 3,000 and 4,000 deaths. Wow, and what are and we're currently at what three hundred thousand? We're we're currently we're we're definitely going to approach three hundred thousand. Right, there's no doubt about it. Um, you I know, thought, I mean, yeah. just to play devil's advocate, sure, play devil's advocate. I always see like these videos online. Like I saw a guy like he took a bunch of masks and he basically inhaled a vape, and then he yeah. just blew out the vape and it just goes straight through the mask. So what is it that's like preventing? Like you still can breathe, so obviously stuff's yes. getting through it. You know, so the particulate. Uh, of the virus is at a density that the mass catches it, you know, so doing, you know, seeing uh, a deceiving video online, I would rather trust the smartest kids in the class who went on to become doctors and scientists and work in medicine as their whole career than somebody who is on YouTube who thinks they are much smarter than they are and they're doing a video which may be hurting people. So you're telling mm -hmm. me Vape God 69 shouldn't be trusted for CDC advice. I am saying vape, <laughs> if you want some advice on vaping, yeah. awesome. Yeah. If Vape God 69 um, has a scientific basis for what he's doing, mm -hmm. great. Um, but don't put energy out there that is potentially gonna hurt people. Because mm -hmm. that's what happens. You know. People need to act more like journalists. When yeah. you read something online. Would you say that journalists need to act more like journalists too? Absolutely journalists <laughs> need to. Journalists need to check their sources, yeah. right? Yeah. They need not to even vet that, their sources. Like, I feel like the media has become such a fear-based fear organization. It's not, even a, it's not even news anymore. It's, oh, it's look. sides. 
So my first day of class is at Rutgers. I had two journalists because my uh, major was broadcast journalism. Same. Mm-hmm. So I had two. The guy in the morning worked for the New York Times. Literally, like a tweed jacket with patches. He had silver hair. I mean, look. If I was casting like a New York Times journalist, this would be the guy. And he's like, "We are the standard bearers of truth. If you have an opinion page, you leave it. Uh, opinion, you leave it on the opinion page." Mm-hmm. Uh, 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 a newspaper has no place for anything but the truth. And then in the afternoon, there was this guy named Greg Morris, and I still remember him. He had this rumpled, like, corduroy jacket, and he worked for the Village Voice. And he's like, sex, race, violence. You got three seconds to sell your paper. You better make sure it's yours. Damn. And I was like, that is the spectrum. And, yeah, look, you know, fear... Um, the stories of like, you know, uh, riots, you know, but that's what, look, I know when there's a police chase on, on TV, I'm sitting mm-hmm. down in front of it and I'm going, Oh, this guy's going to cry. He's going to go off the <laughs> yeah, off yeah. and Oh no, 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 no. And boom. Oh, he missed it. And there's a human nature side of that, but right. our higher self needs to call bullshit on everything, call mm-hmm. bullshit on anything you read, double check your sources, see who's putting that information out there. You know, if it's some nonsense like pandemic, like, well, who financed pandemic? Where are they getting their science from? You know, mm-hmm. that thing went wildfire, but nobody checked. Everyone said, oh, this must be true. I'm like, really? You know, I'm like, check, check this out. Use your brain. We're smarter than this. And pandemic was, wasn't that the um, doc on Netflix, correct? No, no, it was on YouTube. Was was this was a YouTube documentary that had such nonsense in it. Right, it was, the, it was that and one then, woman scientist yeah, court talking yes. the entire time. And then you get a situation where, oh, they took it down. It must have some truth in it. No, they took it down because it's hurting people. Yeah. Because no, uh, Dr. Fauci is not, he did not create the virus and he's not, you know, this evil mastermind. You know, people sometimes forget their intelligence mm-hmm. and we all need to remind each other and it's not about like berating people online and saying dude you're being an idiot it's saying look double check this yeah you know all of the people who were like saying mass didn't work you know how many of those people are dead mm-hmm. all those pastors who were saying google pastors dead coronavirus mm. that is the truth of this virus by the way the ncaa just released this week and they're still figuring out the exact numbers, but high-end college athletes have enlarged hearts that may permanently keep them from being an athlete anymore. Because of? Because of COVID. Really? So they recovered. Some mm. of them were asymptomatic, mm. but now their hearts are enlarged, which is a myocardial thing. And mm-hmm. you know sometimes it's your lungs that get damaged. So just because you recover, you might have now the heart of a decades older person. Mm. And history is watching us. And I want us to look through that lens and say, wow, those idiots just look red. They saw one meme on YouTube or on, on uh, Reddit and they totally believe that. Yeah. Like check your sources, you know? And How by the are way, we supposed to know what to believe? Because I feel like there's, there's always like information coming out of both ends. Like I even have seen things about like Black Lives Matter being like uh, some – organized like thing like, right you, i on, don't know what it was yeah, on, on either side of like whether it's black lives matter whether it's COVID 19 whether it's um I, I mean anything the election yeah. right now any of these things it feels like i mean especially for us as millennials where millennials gen z uh, anybody that's in the social media age i think the hardest thing for us has been trying to decipher the information because mm-hmm. it comes down so quickly and yeah. so rapidly from so many sources and all of them are opposing each other. Yes. All of their fact checks yes. are just the opposites. Yeah. So how do we how do we fact check when the fact check is <laughs> fall- fallible? But, <laughs> yeah. but but the fact check if you dig deep enough right. isn't fallible. Right. You know? You can see, look, there's a thing called entrenched thinking. It's something mm-hmm. everybody does. Yeah. Where I have a mindset and my thing is to defend this mindset. Mhm. But the wisest people among us say, I'm, bring your shotgun. Mm-hmm. Shoot holes in the way I think. Right. If it doesn't stand up to your biggest shotgun blast, mm-hmm. then maybe I need to rethink my position. Yeah. We should be trying to make each other smarter, yeah. you know? And I understand, look, there's a fear like, oh, you know, like 
masks were going to somehow lead to the Constitution being taken away. And by the way, if that happens, I guarantee you I will be there with Wolverine's claws on helping you defeat the <laughs> he resistance. He has them in yes. his, his um, movie room, by the way. But <laughs> The real ones. <laughs> but think about the reality of that. Yeah. So you, we're also thinking like, oh, the military are not the sons and daughters and moms and dads of fellow human beings. Hmm. Like the military are not a bunch of robots. If all of a sudden they said, you all must destroy the constitution. We have gotten our mask mandate through. That is the first step. <laughs> you know, all right. Now, if I wrote that in a movie, yeah. people go, dumbest effing movie ever. Really, masks led to the destruction of the constitution. Right. And I get the fear, you know, mm -hmm. because it's a fearful time. But there's an interesting study. If you really want to understand the mentality, go Google brain differences, liberal conservative. Mm -hmm. And there's a study out of the University of London, which is really fascinating. So they took two groups of people, gave them a questionnaire. They figured out who was um, liberal, who was conservative. And then they um, did several different modalities of measuring fear. So it was like perspiration, pupil dilation, heart rate, blood pressure. And then they put them in front of a monitor and they showed them scary images. Mm -hmm. And they measured the physiological, measurable scientific re reaction to fear. So people who were uh, said to be conservative had an eight times higher reaction of fear that was measurable through science. Mm. So they thought, we effed up. This is not possible. So they yeah, brought I mean, everyone yeah. back. <laughs> I would think that that's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Just based on social media, like yes. to me, liberal people are extremely more uh, fearful. Understand, but yeah. you are coming at it from a conservative mi mindset. Mm -hmm. So now you've got a battle against... I grew up very conservative, you same, know, same. and I'm, I love the middle. I think the far left has its own issues with, with embracing victimhood and the far right has this fight or flight and they're mm -hmm. going to fight and I'm going to get my gun and I'm going to shoot you or we need to like put up a wall, you know, yeah, yeah. but this is the, this is the science of it. So what I'm going to say to you is call bullshit. Check it out. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, I'm in the middle. Yeah. I got yeah. no, I got, <laughs> I got no um, side. Uh -huh. But this was what the science was. They found, and then they brought everyone back. They said, let's do it again. We have to double check our results. And they got the same exact results, except this time they scanned their brains. And they found biological differences in the brain structure between liberal and conservative people in the neuroplastic section of the brain. So the neuroplastic section of the brain is the part of the brain that can grow. So mm -hmm. if you learn a musical instrument or a language, or uh, how to ride a motorcycle, that part of your brain will bro grow. And they found in conservative people, the amygdala was much larger. The amygdala is the fight or flight center of the brain. Mm -hmm. It is also where fear is based. Mm -hmm. Fear and aggression. Yes, fear that. and aggression, yeah. yes. And then, I, I don't remember this exactly, but I think it's the prefrontal cortex. cortex, left cortex, in liberal people, which tries to find connections is larger. So when you look at the right, it's we need strong police, we need strong military, don't take away my guns, uh, we need a wall. And when you look at the left, it's like the environment, uh, human rights, um, animal rights. So it's all of this connection stuff. Mm -hmm. I feel like the best way is left, is, liberal is open-minded, right is closed-minded. Mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I don't think it's as simple as that. I think you need a balance between the two because you don't want to be too so connected where you become overly sensitive, mm -hmm. you know? And when you go too far to the left, in my opinion, everything, you see everything through a victim goggle, you mm -hmm. know? And you don't own your own crap, your own personal responsibility, you know? Um, and then when you go to the right, it all becomes about fear. And here's what was interesting in, in London. So people who were from rural areas of London were more conservative because they didn't meet a lot of diverse people. Mm. But as they moved into London, the amygdala shrank. So, oh, there's a gay person. There's a, a person of African descent. There's a Jew, Jewish person. And when they moved back to those rural areas, which were not as diverse, and maybe their only perception uh, was from stories or fears or prejudices, the amygdala didn't regrow. Because I had an experience with those diverse people and I realized, wow, those are human souls going through the same struggles that I'm going through. And it's not about us versus them. It's about we. 
I think that's something that I, I try to talk about a lot, whether it's in like podcasts or in the vlogs even is just like, you know, there's so much more connection between all of us than there is disconnection. We have so much more as humans to connect over than we do as things not to connect over. Yeah. You know, there's, there's infinite reasons for us. Hold on. We're getting a call and it's coming through on all of my things. We can hear it. (laughs) Um, and, uh, no, I think there's, there's so many ways for us to connect and we look for all the reasons to disconnect. And a lot of times it's weird how social media is the most connective tissue through the entire world. We've never been more connected with the entire world than we have now, but we've also never been more disconnected with each other than we have now. Yep. And it feels like the conversations that we're allowed to have have to be stimulated and stipulated only on the fact that if I disagree with you, I have to keep my mouth shut. And mm-hmm. if you disagree with me, you have to keep your mouth shut. And I miss, like, we have a buddy, Kerry O'Quinn. Kerry is one of the most opinionated people you'll ever meet. But because of him, I learned how special confrontation can be and how perfecting of your, your mindset and how beautiful your conversations and real connection can be with other people. And Tom, I, how, how do you perceive it from the time that you were a kid to, to now? How has connection shaped itself differently? You know, it's interesting because I think Gen X is sort of this middle ground. You know, Gen X Mm -hmm. is also my generation was the one who really did was at the Internet at its formation, whether Mm -hmm. it was Google, Elon, you know, Musk with PayPal or um, so. But we remember what it was like not to have the Pavlovian shackle Mm -hmm. of the smartphone. And even pre smartphone, it was a different world. And sometimes I think my grandfather used to say the devil's in the noise. And I always just say, well, what is, you know, I didn't know what that meant. And finally, when I was 16, after I'm saying it for several years, he's like, the devil's in the noise. I'm like, what does that mean? He's like, well, how do you wake up in the morning? And I'm like, well, you know, uh, my alarm clock goes off, the clock radio and Howard Stern's on. He's like, then what do you do? Well, I'm like, well, I take a shower. Then I have breakfast. What do you do while I have my breakfast? I turn the TV on, see what's on the news. And then what do you do? Well, I drive to school. He's like, what do you do while you're driving the car? Well, I put the radio back on. And he's like, the devil's in the noise. And now with this, this has become the ultimate puppeteer Mm -hmm. in good ways and in bad. Mm -hmm. And we need to acknowledge the negative of this. I know when I crack my screen and I went and turned my phone in and it was going to take two hours. I reached in my pocket at least 20 times going, oh, I need to check. As yeah. soon as your brain goes quiet and we need to balance that out. That's where I think millennials and especially Gen Z turn it off one day a week. Mm-hmm. And people are like, oh, I can't do that. No, but you will find yourself maybe appreciating the connection more. Um, it's so hard to reverse engineer people. I get yeah. it. I get it. Like I'm the we, same way. Like the marketing and societal like expectation of your phone. Like you have to be on social media, all this yeah. stuff. Like but what, social pressure. But what does this say? <clears throat> what's your, what's your heart say? Oh, bro. I fucking, it's my job. I hate it more than anything. <laughs> yeah. I know. But, but one day a week for you? No, I love it. We yeah. went up to Big Bear and we had no Good. service. I went down to Mexico, had no service. Yeah. I was living my best life. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you know what? a three week cleanse after this. Yeah. yeah. You know what? The audience out there, they know it too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know? but, yeah, and it's like the FOMO. It's the, the fear of missing. Yes, yeah. Not even just missing out. It's just like you you fear not being in the loop. Yeah, of like what other people are doing, and it's like mm-hmm. our 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 generation is so invested in whatever everyone else is doing. Like we lose yeah. sight of like what we fucking want. Yeah, but you know, sometimes we we've come to underappreciate the power of silence, mm-hmm. and you know. We're, we're going through a lot of ground. It, it feels like since COVID, it's been like that week after Christmas, except now it's the whole year, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. where it's like, oh, I don't know. What day is it? What's going on? Are we doing <laughs> anything? Um, so I always like, I like when you're in a group of people, right? Yeah. And you're, let's say we're talking like this and there's like, how long do you think before uh, of silence? Like after we finish our conversation, someone's going to pull up their phone because they're like bored. Yeah. Literally, probably five seconds. seconds. Yeah, oh, like we finished talking and yeah. we're just sitting here and we have nothing to say. Yep, 
all right, pull up my phone, yeah. you know, like, mm-hmm. and what I appreciate about, you know, the sort of my young adult years was we didn't have that. Yeah. We mm-hmm. would sit and we would talk and we would just sort of chill out and it wasn't this default. My brain needs to be fed mm-hmm. nonsense. And it's not like this teaches us a lot of deep things, mm-hmm. you know, um, and it's great for communicating. It's great when we control it, not when it controls us. Yeah. And that's what we all need to be aware of. And we know it, it makes us a better human and a less human. And we need to shrink that part that makes us less human. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're talking about like being more human and less human. I wanted to actually like touch on a few things is like mental health a little bit and like where where you see us succeeding in mental health the changes that you've seen since you were a kid to now yeah i think you know it's interesting and if you would like i don't know if you're comfortable with it but talk about your journey a little bit yeah specifically absolutely yeah um so uh just finished a a documentary called lost in america which deals with youth youth homelessness Mm -hmm. and uh we released it in february uh and then two weeks later uh covid shut down everything but in that documentary, it's something really interesting. Um, and the director, Rotimi Rainwater, did an amazing job. But what we discovered was in 1983, mm. uh, all of the mental hospitals in this country were shut down. And all of those people were dumped on the street. So when I was a little kid, there was no homeless people. And I mean that. They were all, like my dad was a cop. My dad said, all right, we found somebody sleeping on the street. By the way, cops used to get at, my dad was a cop in the inner city in Newark, uh, in Elizabeth, New Jersey, which is right next to Newark. And cops would go out and they would walk a neighborhood. They wouldn't sit in their car. So they got to know everybody in the neighborhood. Mm. And if somebody was asleep on the street, they would pull out their nightstick and tap them on the bottom of the shoe. And he said 80% of the time they were drunk. He said about 15% of the time they were mentally ill. And you would take those people to a mental health hospital. And there they would get treatment. And yes, there were abuses there as magnified by, you know, one of my favorite films, you know, One Who Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Yeah. Um, and there was an expose that Geraldo Rivera did, which was so important. But we threw the baby out with the bathwater. Mm-hmm. And I think we're being intellectually dishonest. There are so many homeless people who just need that home and that job and that place to stay. But the overwhelming majority of homeless people need substance abuse treatment and mental health treatment. Mm -hmm. And that's the reality. This is not something that warehousing people is gonna work. We need a national initiative to reopen all of the mental hospitals. Mm -hmm. And my older brother um, went through a slow decline with being bipolar and paranoid delusional. And we watched, and there was nothing we could do. My cousin uh, works f- uh, in a very high position in mental health in the state of New Jersey. It's where I grew up. And we would talk to them. And they said, look, the law is unless they physically hurt themselves or physically hurt another human being, there's nothing we can do. Mm. The mom and dad of the Sandy Hook shooter called New York State for years saying, please help us with our child. We don't have the skill set to deal with this. Mm-hmm. The state said the same thing. That kid ended up getting an automatic weapon and going in and slaughtering a bunch of kindergarten kids. The mental health um, situation in this country is directly tied to the homeless situation. Um, and we need to treat all of these people living on the streets like they are our family. Yeah. Would you say majority, I don't know the statistics, I'm sure you do, but our majority of homeless people... Like, are they, are they there for mental health? Are they there from drug abuse? Are they they, like veterans? Like I see, like, honestly, during COVID it's gotten way worse. Like you go to Hollywood and they, the, I don't know who, but they put porta potties. They're just letting every homeless person live there. There's porta potties there. Like they're Mm -hmm. pretty much encouraging it by putting a place to go to the bathroom there. Yeah. And like, especially you go into that bridge in Gower, like Mm -hmm. you get off the exit in Hollywood. It's just swarming. If you guys have been to Venice, like literally just the entire boardwalk is just tense and it's not, I'm not saying anything bad against like homelessness. I'm not trying to challenge their position, but what I'm saying is like, I think there is a certain level of like, there's, there's drug abuse inside of that. There's disease. Like they had the bubonic plague come back in for the first time in what a hundred years. Yep. 
Like that's what there were people infected in Los Angeles City Hall who ended up suing um, the city because they got the plague. Yeah. Um, so there's and, just a certain level of like yeah. healthcare that's not being provided. How can you help homeless people? Because you know you, you have a lot of people say like, oh, you, look, know, you it, can't it, help people that don't want to help themselves. Um, look, this is a situation also where we need to acknowledge that these people are not able to make coherent decision for themselves anymore. So we need to make, as a community, as a mm -hmm. country, we need to make the decisions for them. And, and who would fund such a thing? How would it, how we go how back to the care? way it was, the mm -hmm. way it was, was the federal government, our tax dollars mm -hmm. funded this, you know, mm -hmm. the fact that rather than a military exploit, why don't we fund and help? Why doesn't Jeff here? Bezos cure homelessness? Because there's enough okay. tax loopholes, you know, look, it, this is a larger national mm -hmm. issue that I'm just needs saying, to like, come down to. Yeah, look, billion, hundred of billionaire, almost a trillionaire, yeah. probably. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. So look, he could literally cure it. He could. Bill Gates. They could all come together and cure it. Why don't they? Because they won't unless the government gives them structure that this is your tax money and this is where it's going to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So things like like why should the taxpayer pay for a company's private jet? Or you want a skybox at the Staples Center. Mm -hmm. I'm going to write that off entertainment on my taxes. Mm -hmm. This is ludicrous. You golfing. Know? Yeah. Golfing. Your, your whole golf club membership. Your, mm -hmm. um, you know, we need to go to a very simplified tax. We should have no deductions. If you want a skybox that's coming out of your corporate thing. Zero deductions. Um, and look, what the baby boom needs to realize is... The playing field is not level. It would sort of be like playing Monopoly, right? So imagine the baby boom is one guy, and then it's Gen X, and then it's millennials, and then it's Gen Z. But baby boom already has park place and boardwalk, a stack of cash, hotels all around everything. And he's like, all right, let's play. The government has failed epically in keeping monopolies down. Mm -hmm. It used to be in this town. I think it was 1983 that 50 companies controlled 90% of the media. I saw today, something. I sent you that. Yeah. It's yeah. like, I don't know how many companies control like the whole entire network. Six or seven. Today, right it is five companies right. control 96% of the media in this town. Because it used to be you couldn't own distribution and production. Mm hmm. Because guess what happens? Once you can create a monopoly, you don't need outside people anymore. Mm -hmm. One of my mentors was Glenn Larson. Mm -hmm. And I also got to know Aaron Spelling a little bit. And Aaron Spelling said, I'm done. The networks now can own their own production and own their own shows. They don't need me anymore. Mm -hmm. So we have gone from spreading the wealth around, you know? And for as much as, uh, look, Disney should never, ever have been allowed to buy Fox. Yeah. You know, and I get it. In the chess game that is this business, I get it. For the betterment of everyone's grandchildren, those all of these companies need to be broken up. We need Teddy Roosevelt to come back in and just smash up all these monopolies. And guess what that does to a company? Mm -hmm. It unlocks wealth. Look at what Standard Oil did. Standard Oil was owned by a gentleman by the name of Rockefeller. And the one man at one time, controlled 2% of the United States wealth. He would be a multi-trillionaire in today's dollars. Hmm. But go look at the Wikipedia page when Teddy Roosevelt broke up Standard Oil. It became 100 different companies. Wow. With 100 different presidents and 100 different vice presidents. And all of that wealth, which was going to a few oligarch-like people, got shattered. Mm -hmm. And now, capitalism thrived. Mm -hmm. The danger is, is corporatism is becoming the new communism mm -hmm. where I'm going to work my whole life for the corporation. The corporation will own all of my ideas. And that is something that makes for a worse planet for everybody. I mean, I, f I feel like in the future, Amazon's going to control everything. Uh, Netflix is going to own all the movie business. Like Spotify is going to, or Apple. Yeah. Well, Netflix has you a know? big challenge ahead. They control all entertainment. Yeah, yeah. Netflix... The one Achilles heel of Netflix um, is they don't own a library. So hmm. once all of the studios start their own streaming services, which will eventually happen, you're going to have Disney, you're going to have a Warner's, you know, um, 
And it's weird because Warner's chose to go with HBO as a brand as opposed to Warner streaming, which I think is a mistake. But because I think Warner's with its giant library could really survive too. I think if you did HBO as a premium service and Warner's for all the material, you, and, but what's going to get murdered here are the cable companies because they're the middlemen. So it'll actually be people will be getting more content for less money, but the cable companies are dead. They know it. But it feels um, like we've got new cable companies because now we're getting bundled with like HBO, Disney, and Netflix. Or you do yes. Hulu, CBS, and Peacock. But now you have that choice. Right. Right? So Peacock, is that NBC? Yeah. yeah. I know, it's a horrible name. That's terrible. Wait, they're called Peacock? <laughs> yeah. Should just call it Cock. I did yeah. not know that. <laughs> you can say that, I guess. Um, um, but, you know, you look, and, you know, the one thing, that, Paramount's got an awesome opportunity, right? Because Paramount, Viacom, has Paramount CBS, but they have something that is the secret weapon, which is Nickelodeon. Mm. Because parents, when choosing, oh, I'm going to get Disney and I'm going to buy the, the thing that has Nickelodeon. And that is something that I'm sure people at Viacom are thinking of. If not, you better start thinking of it. Mm. Um, but then once all of those movies and television shows get pulled back, and if they're only exclusively on Disney or Warner's, or Paramount, that is where Netflix may got may get caught. Mm -hmm. hmm. Because then... Netflix doesn't have any cartoons or kid shows. Well, Netflix has bought like, out a lot of their anime. originals, I'm yeah. saying. Mm -hmm. uh, they've, got movies. Few, they've got a few originals, but like comparatively, if everybody were to take all their content back, yeah. they'd be screwed. Yeah, but I'm saying they haven't made like a Sweet Life of Zack and Cody TV show on Netflix. Yeah. Stranger Things. Yeah, but that's still but that's it's more, dark, it's morbid, yeah. it's still yeah. an adult audience. Mm -hmm. But you're right. You know, that sort of kid branding is something Netflix should be really focusing on. Um, you know, I wanted to ask that too earlier about when mm -hmm. we were talking about X-Men and like your love for comic books. Yeah. How do you think it is that like those kid driven obsessions, like adults still go to them? You know, like the movies are made for adults essentially. Yeah. Like the Joker, for mm -hmm. example, and Batman and like. I see those movies. I'm like, oh, this is a dope movie. Yeah. But it's like a kid thing. How do you turn a kid thing into an adult thing? See, I don't think it's necessary. I think it's the way the lens you look at it through. I was never so, watching yeah. those things growing up or yeah. comic books or anything, but I still like the movies. Yeah. So, look, I think you could tell the Joker story in a, you know, 1960s way where Cesar Romero is painting over his mustache <laughs> and it's a very cartoony version. Yeah. Very, it's very Andy Warhol pop which is what the 60s were about. Um, and then you get Mark Hamill doing his awesome interpretation in the animated series. Uh, or Joaquin Phoenix. Or, you know, um, you know, look Ledger. at The Dark Knight, which yeah. is the best of the Nolan films by mm -hmm. far. Um, Heath Ledger is magic in that film. Mm -hmm. And he's fearless, you know. And there's so many interpretations of that character because it really is about what if... I broke. What if my mind just completely snapped and I just went and became that thing? And that lives in every person, just like Batman lives in every person. And when it speaks to us on those mythic levels, on those mm -hmm. big story levels, you know, and the crazy thing is when you look at mythology, right? So Joseph Campbell, who was sort of the pattern or the, the, the person who Yoda was based after, um, he was a teacher at Columbia University, and what he found, which was really interesting, and it, it was interesting, when I watched these interviews with Bill Moyers, it helped me recover from my Catholicism, but what it taught me was human beings who had no contact with one another were asking the same mortal questions through their myths for thousands of years before they had contact. You know? So what is that meaning of life? What is that thing in the Joker which keeps us sane and on that edge and when we finally snap and we go into anarchy? Which is what is happening a lot with the, uh, the rioting, mm -hmm. you know? There's a difference between protest and rioting, you know? As soon as you start a fire and you start busting windows and looting shoe stores, that's a riot. It's yeah, not Mark a protest. I saw that you know? firsthand. Yeah. It's pretty scary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was yeah. rough. And look, I grew up in a city yeah. that was scarred by a riot. And we were part yeah. of white flight out of that city. Yeah. Because everybody was afraid. What was white flight? White flight was 70s, mm -hmm. urban America. 
a lot of the immigrant communities, Irish, Italian, Jewish communities that had grown up in the inner city, when riots happened and parts of the cities were burned out mm -hmm. and those businesses left and never recovered, people, crime rate went up. Mm -hmm. I remember as a little kid them putting the projects in and as soon as they took down those little neighborhoods and started warehousing people, like, like it was like the worst parts of business school. Like how do we um, effectively warehouse people for the cheapest per foot, square foot thing? Just set up people to not Just wait. set up people to, to enter into an energy where it becomes like, it, 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 there's no hope. Yeah. Um, Cabrini Green in Chicago, you know, mm -hmm. you look at these places, these are places where if you put any human in there, mm -hmm. they're going to start feeding on each other. Yeah. It's amazing that anyone comes out of those places. It was like the Stanford prison experiments, right? Exactly. Yes. Where yeah. you split up two groups of people unbiasedly, you just literally divide based on a randomization. Yep. And no matter what, the people in the position of power end up abusing the people in the position of submission. Yep. And vice versa, the people in the position of submission eventually have, some of them have enough and start the revolt. Yeah. And that's, I feel like that's a lot of what we're seeing right now is kind of like the Stanford prison experiment play out in full action yeah. in front of us. And also what, what is, what's the purpose of this country anymore? Mm -hmm. You know, is it, oh, my Amazon stock went up this much. Oh, my, my picture got like this or my video got like this. I saw something, yeah. someone was like, you didn't choose to be born you were just born and now you now you live your whole life having to pay for being born <laughs> <laughs> it's so like, true like i didn't fucking choose to be here my parents mm -hmm. put me here and now i have to pay and survive like mm -hmm. I, who but I, oh, I don't understand like dude because if yeah. you really break it down it's like yeah. who decided that the government's in charge who yeah. decided that these are laws who decided that you have to pay for shit like who decided i have to buy a yeah. house like why can't they just go fucking build a house on the river why do i have to own the land you know yeah. what i'm saying like yeah. who decided boardwalk? all this shit the bubonic plague in venice boardwalk <laughs> and and, uh, and batman and like who batman. owned all the land in the united states before it was being sold because someone uh, had to own it uh, or did you just actually claim it? it was it was never owned so you just uh, claimed the, it yeah no the native americans did not believe in ownership you just the, you were symbiotic with the land mm -hmm. that's why when you know white settlers came over and said hey you want this big trunk filled with beads and crap uh, for Manhattan, they're like, yeah, you can't own the land, you know? So mm -hmm. there's this mentality of competition and of, you know, I need more. Um, and there's a lack of appreciation for what we have. Mm -hmm. You know, when we look outside, right? So we're living on the shoulders of all the past generations. Who, when you drive across this country, you see Hoover Dam and you see the infrastructure. Look, we have what we have. You know, yeah, the economic system is a giant cluster F and it is built on a house of cards and that comes out of business schools and fraudulent, you know, uh, leadership that we've had for many decades. Um, but we can't lose the fact that when you go outside your door, there's streets and there's parks and there's homes and we have all these things and, and don't get overwhelmed by you know, this giant wave of debt that is coming, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, you know, we're better than this. And, you know, and by the way, I believe in reincarnation. So I think you chose actually to come back. You fucking crazy. Who ass you person. are. So don't be, don't be <laughs> blaming your parents for bringing you in this world. Listen, I'm fucking ag agnostic, but, um, I actually wanted to talk to you a little bit cause you're one of the, you're one of the people in my life that when I went through, my dark night of the soul, when I went through challenging my entire belief system, you mentioned you know, uh, reincarnation, but I, I came from a very Christian background and I had some fairly traumatizing things happen to me, which I told you about. Yep. And you helped me walk through it and I found something that I hadn't found before, which was kind of like a new, a new mentor inside of this very new world. And I was having, I was challenging all of my beliefs and I was at this really dark phase with depression and anxiety and thoughts of just driving into the other side of traffic, right? And you stepped in and you were like, hey, that's okay. I've been there too, right? We, there's a lot of people that go through a lot of things and a lot of times this is just, this is like the butterfly in a cocoon. And I wanted to ask you, 
because I mean, you walked me through. We we've walked through a lot together. Yes, for sure. Um, but I wanted to ask you because your foundation and your belief was so comforting to me, but it didn't stem from religion as much as it stemmed from who you were as a human, just truth. What, how did you shape that? Because you grew up Catholic and then your trajectory was so different from what it could have been. Yeah. Could you explain a little bit of that? Yeah. Look, Even like I, the mentality of how you mentored me on no kiss list and things like that. Yeah. Look, I, th- I think, you know, everybody has their own journey. And I look, we're, I think we're here not to evolve biologically. I do think we're here to evolve as souls. Mm. Um, I do think we've been here before. Yeah. I think we've been rich. We've been poor. We've been, you know, uh, powerful. We've been weak and abused and. We're here to help each other become better souls. Mm-hmm. And look, I had 12 years of like, you know, New Jersey, my dad's a cop, <laughs> uh, Irish, Italian, 12 years of Catholic school. That's a mindset that challenges a soul to break out of, mm. you know? And I think, you know, anyone who was raised in a rigid religious atmosphere like I was, to the point where I thought I was possessed by a demon and I had this thing to overcome. And what that teaches you, it teaches you that all of those questions that you're asking your head to call bullshit on this stuff, mm-hmm. that's from God. Mm-hmm. So any question you have about your religion, about your faith, this doesn't make sense, bring it out. Why did you think you were possessed by a demon? Oh, that goes into a lot of issues with, you know, um, uh, the way I, you know, so, you know, growing up in New Jersey um, in the 80s when I was, you know, uh, dealing with a lot of my issues of sexuality. Mm -hmm. So my, I remember watching, watching my cousin die um, when I was in high school. Mm-hmm. And it was funny. My family, everyone knew he was gay. Mm-hmm. Um, and he had AIDS. And he was part of that generation. It's like COVID, you know? Imagine you go and have sex with someone. And then you're waiting to see if, oh, did that kill me? Mm-hmm. And as humanity, how did we react to that? Did we react in a loving, Jesus like way? Or did the president of the United States not acknowledge it for eight years, which was Ronald Reagan. Mm. So three days before my cousin Robert died, we were in the hospital and we said goodbye. And um, I remember him sitting in the bed and he looked like images I had seen from concentration camp victims. And this guy who was so cool and so filled with life And he gave me all of his G.I. Joes and my (laughs) brothers and, you know, and now he was three days away from dying and he couldn't say a word, but he was looking at us with these eyes. And for me, that really haunted me, you know, Mm -hmm. because I felt like he was such a good person and he was dying for no reason because this country had failed him. There was no, there was no big push for a vaccine like there is now. Um, so that kind of froze me in my development. So, you know, when you're, you know, an all American kid who's, you know, um, you know, the, the prototypical, you know, kid trying to be perfect, uh, uh, and you realize you like guys and it becomes something that in that age you hid, you buried it. Because the alternative was people around you were dying and also the only images you had were from the gay pride parade, which were either men dressed as nuns or you know women on motorcycles and it didn't, there was no other image of that, you know? Mm-hmm. So for Gen X, you know, in my generation, you buried it mm-hmm. and eventually it starts to, and I remember the last girl that I dated and um, it was Valentine's Day and I bought her chocolates and roses and we had this great relationship. Um, 
And then two weeks later, I broke up with her. Hmm. And she started crying. And I realized, wow, you are a coward. You need to own your shit. And that was my soul's journey, you know? I was a white, straight male, New Jersey, angry at affirmative action. And then all of a sudden, God, the universe, the force, whatever you want to call it, says, no, I'm going to make you a mutant. Mm -hmm. And I used to think it was a curse. And now I realize it's the biggest blessing I've ever had because it taught me empathy mm -hmm. that I wouldn't have had any other way. So now there's laws that are different. I, ca I can't join the military. Mm -hmm. Don't ask, don't tell. I had friends in the military six months before they were supposed to retire, got fired. No pension, nothing. There's the door. Serve this you can't country. can't be gay in the military? You couldn't, yeah. Oh, at the time. You can't now, yeah. Now you can, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I'm talking about that journey. You know, I couldn't get married. I still can't give blood, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I have O negative blood, which means I can give blood to anybody. Mm. Um, but Even though you're disease free, you still yes. can't give yeah. blood. Yes. That's insane. Disease free. Um, by the way, anyone who grew up in that era um, of getting that HIV test, mm -hmm. it's kind of what that feeling is to a smaller degree with COVID. Mm. You know, when you're waiting, you're seeing that result. Oh, do I have it? Do I not? Um, yeah. Because when you, but imagine every time you had sex with someone, you were afraid you were going to die. Mm. And that was the reality of that. And that taught me that empathy. Um, and ultimately, it made me a better soul. Yeah. Because I feel like, I mean, every time I have sex, I'm scared that someone's going to get pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> Practically the same thing. <laughs> Probably heighten that experience times 100. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, uh, yes, they have been. Uh, so, kids, come on in. Come, and come on you in. are no, yeah, the don't father. Expose, don't expose yeah. me. Hi, Maury Povich. <laughs> There's, we've actually been holding them exactly. outside. There's about two dozen yeah, right? of them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Ancestry DNA thanks you for your results. Um, <laughs> Probably got some running around out there. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's a joke, guys. Just no, you're going to be a great dad. I will when I'm ready. Yeah. Yes, when you're ready, be ready. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was, you know, that was my journey in a way that, you know, I thought it was a curse. I thought it was something that was um, evil. And you mm -hmm. realize that it is a blessing. Yeah. And even today, you know, you get people who are super religious, mm -hmm. right? And they are the opposite of what Jesus talked about. Mm. You know, any pastor that has a private jet is full of shit. Who are you talking about? That guy? I'm talking about any Joel of Joel Steen. Joel Steen. <laughs> I'm talking about any of Wait, Yo, Joel, we're yeah. calling you out, baby. It was good. <laughs> yeah. Come on the pod. Uh, and they know it deep down. Yeah. Um, that is not what Jesus taught, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, Jesus is, if, if you have a watch that could feed a thousand people, sell that watch. Mm -hmm. If you wanna walk that life, and people who give money to those people, stop. Mm -hmm. Stop today. Go give it to your neighbor down the street who is elderly and can't afford groceries. Yeah. That's the way you can act Christ-like. Uh, your your story is so amazing to me because you you taught me something along the way of when I was in in the phase that I had described earlier where I was like I was really at this dark place in my life but also you taught me something when I was researching for the role of no kiss list for those of you that have seen it I played Eli in Amy and Eli's no kiss list and I really didn't have a whole lot of true healthy figures in my life that I could talk to and ask these questions about how to shape, truly shape this character to, especially from older generations, like especially back in, you know, I was just like anybody that was gay. I knew one gay guy like that was out, but he was also Mormon. So he wasn't out and he wasn't gay. And yeah. It was very confusing. Um, and we sat down and we talked and you gave me perspective and you shared what you just said a minute ago, your empathy with me in so many insightful ways because at this time that I was shooting the movie, suddenly I was disowned by half of my family and I still haven't spoken to them. It's almost 10 years later. Yeah, I had been rejected by all of the churches that I grew up in, minus one pastor who actually reached out and said he was proud. Yeah. <clears throat> then on top of that, I had friends and acquaintances and so much 
hate spew towards me just for portraying a role. It's acting. Yep. I was simply portraying a role in a way that I thought was truthful and respectful to the people that I loved, being you, being Carrie, being one of my uncles, being, you know, friends that I grew up in school with that finally came out and like told me in private, right? Yep. And that journey that it gave me just a modicum of insight of what possible stuff that you must have gone through in a generation before me where it was even harder to do that or what maybe somebody like Carrie must have gone through yep. in a generation before you. Like I can't, I can't imagine the amount of torment that must have been going through your head in that. Yeah, look, it, it was a situation where, and look, it was worse for the generation before me. Before mm -hmm. me, um, you could be Los Angeles. You think a very liberal city. Well, if there was more than 10 men at a party, all of you could be arrested. You need at least one one woman, one woman. Is that a real thing? That's a real thing. Yeah. Jesus. So, um, you couldn't hold a government job after World War II. Um, they banned all gay and lesbian people from holding any sort of government positions. Mm -hmm. These people had served the country, uh, and then they all had to go, and it became one of these things where, you know, the place where. You know, we have the least empathy mm -hmm. is usually when we hide behind religion. You know, religion is the great, sometimes the great wolf in sheep's clothing. Yeah. Um, and we see it every day. You know, we see it like, you know, look at what the fall walls are going through. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it shows they're human, you know. Yeah. And... When you bury it, look at the Catholic Church, my people, you know, look, with religion, it's the only way you could justify slavery, right? Mm -hmm. So in 1854, the Baptist Church says slavery is an abomination. You can no longer be a Baptist and support slavery. So what happens? Anyone out there who's Southern Baptist, go Google Southern Baptist founding tenets of their religion. So the founding tenets of the Southern Baptist religion are you can hit your slave, you just cannot hit them so hard as you knock their teeth out. Hmm. And that is a major religion in this country hmm. that was started as a break off from the Baptist religion so that people could still own other people. How evil is that? And guess what that's in? It's in a little magic book called the Bible. So did God at one time say, oh, it's okay for humans to own other humans? Or is this book inherently flawed? And is this book the litmus test in which God's greatest gift to us, our free will, and our discernment is supposed to challenge it? Hmm. Because it says amazingly beautiful things. Turn the other cheek. Love your brother. And then it gives you the proper etiquette for stoning a prostitute. Confusing. God, yeah. It's not, it's not confusing. It's completely clear. It's never been confusing. And that is the challenge we have. Mm -hmm. The only way you can convince people to drive planes into a building on today, mm -hmm. 19 years ago, and kill three, over 3,000 people. Oh, God wants me to do this. Mm -hmm. My crazy Catholics with the Inquisition. We're gonna burn you alive unless you accept the Catholic Church. And it was interesting because part of Ancestry DNA, I found out I am part Ashkenazi Jewish. Mm -hmm. So at some time in my history, some of my relatives were about to burn other of my relatives <laughs> for not converting. And that is the honest call BS out part of humanity. Mm -hmm. um, and it's always where evil hides in religion mm -hmm. and I think it was the same thing dealing with gay people you know mm -hmm. um, it's like you know what I realized and it was the greatest gift to me it wasn't it doesn't matter who you love it matters that you love mm. and whatever energy you put out there you're gonna get back and I believe in karma and do unto others um, but that's why also I think the younger generation is calling out a lot of these old things and saying this makes no sense to me. 
and trust that. Trust that voice. That little voice in you calling all out, all, all the bullshit out, that I believe is God. Hmm. You know, and look, there was Entertainment Weekly, going back to the, used to have a year end issue where they would list all of the people in the industry who died of AIDS. And it would be hundreds and hundreds of people. And that was done to try and bring empathy. Hmm. But it was always seen as somebody, oh, those are those people. Those people are dirty. They're they're evil. They're you know, but you know we're not devils and demons. We are your sons and your daughters and your uncles and your aunts, and your brothers and your sisters, and we are a reflection of how loving a soul you are. So if you really want to see how loving a soul you are, look at how you treat those that are different than you. Hmm. And that's my truth. That's, I mean, that's just wildly powerful. And I, that was something that shaped that entire conversation right there. It's yeah. something that helped shape me and my journey. I hope you guys actually listen and re-listen to exactly what just Tom just said. Because it's, that's insight. That's years of insight that you can't just get out of a book or get off of Google or get off of Twitter. That's experience. But it's also, you know, actors and artists who go into that you know it takes mm -hmm. it takes a lot of courage and balls to go do a part look mm -hmm. they could not find actors for brokeback mountain for years mm -hmm. you know and a lot of actors were afraid of that part yeah. you know just google it you'll see the list jake gyllenhaal signed up early ang lee and then this little actor named heath ledger just said i love this i'm going to do this mm -hmm. by the way what was the first reaction online to Heath Ledger's announcement as the Joker, and I, you can Google it and find it. Uh, was Did they try to ban him? Was hatred. Yeah. So they called it "Broke Back Joker." Look, all the shit we got on X Men One, uh, the 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 vitriol, the hate from very well known um, websites. You know, what, why'd you get it on X Men One? Um, because it was seen as like gay X Men. You know, there was when we. We cast Jimmy Mars, and Jimmy did a crazy amazing job as Cyclops. Yeah, you know, um, and is such an underrated actor and such a, a, a real gift to this planet. Um, but there was a website called Any Cool News out of Austin, run by a, a, a good guy, but he let a lot of evil things go through that website. Hmm. And he put on a photo of Jimmy in a bathtub with a shampoo horn. That was like this really great photo of him just goofing around. And they said, this is your Cyclops. And they had slanted the article in a way just to gay bash. Mm. And when Hugh Jackman was like, oh, here comes show tunes, mm -hmm. you know. And it became this thing where it was this, this really vitriolic anti-gay sentiment online around the movie from certain websites. Mm -hmm. And then opening weekend happened. And all of those people shut the fuck up. And that's what art does. You know, yeah. art is the best weapon good has on the planet. Mm -hmm. I do not know who the number one investment banker of 1600 was, nor do we care. Yeah. History remembers three people. They remember the warriors, they remember the scientists, and most of all, they remember the artists. I've been lucky enough to travel this whole planet, every country on this planet, the temples they build to their history house their art. Art lets us take our shoes off and put somebody else's shoes on. You know, everyone's like, oh, why are you going to China, you know, 10 years ago? I love the Chinese people. They're an amazing people. Yeah. Because I'm fighting for a Star Trek future, mm -hmm. not a Mad Max future. And now because of leadership uh, all over the planet, everybody's entrenching, everybody's fear, everybody's like, you know, my country right or wrong. You know, if my country turns to the dark side, I'm joining the resistance, you know? Yeah. And that's, that's what America should stand for, you know? What can we do as artists and as entertainers and storytellers and as fans or as people watching? What, what are proactive steps 
that we can consistently take. Like Mark and I always try to sit down and challenge each other on like, what are the, what's the message we're telling behind each vlog? Yeah. What's the message we're telling behind just anything. Sometimes it's just pure entertainment for entertainment's purpose. Yeah. But other times there is really like, we want to say something deeper, but how do you, when you're, when you're shaping X-Men and when you're shaping transformers, how do you sit there and say, here's the overarching message for all the kids that feel like mutants? Yeah. Um, you know, I think it goes back to what does this say about the human condition? Mm -hmm. You know, look, the, when I was writing the treatment, which was the original storyline for X-Men, I'm like, okay, I know these characters really well. All right. I need to pull one of these characters out and them to be the audience. Mm -hmm. So I said, I'm going to make that character Wolverine because he was my favorite character. Um, I still have photos of a birthday cake a friend made for me <laughs> with Wolverine on the very 80s version of Wolverine. Um, uh, but when you are telling a story, you've got to think about the audience. And for some people, that is going to be the first time they're seeing X-Men. Mm -hmm. So with Hugh Jackman's character, and, and here's I think the thing about any art, is you want people to be able to take their shoes off and put somebody else's shoes on. Mm -hmm. So when we started doing X-Men, they're like, oh, you're doing X-Files? And you're like, no, it's X-Men. <laughs> like, what's X-Men? <laughs> the only people who knew it were younger kids who had seen the cartoon. Mm -hmm. And then you had a few older adults who had read the comic book in the 80s. Nobody else knew who X-Men was. Right. Zero. There were four people in this town who were comic book fans, and I can name them uh, at that time. Um, but Hugh Jackman is like, you know, he's, he's like walking through this school and he's in this underground thing and then he goes upstairs and he's like, oh, what is this? You know, it's like, uh, this is Storm, this is Cyclops. What do they call you, Wheels? You know, <laughs> that's the audience. That was, he was the voice of the audience at that time. Yeah. So if you're telling a story, try and find a way in mm -hmm. so that the person who's sitting there, whether it's through a piece of music through a stage show, through a film, a television show, um, a painting, where they can step into your art. Um, I loved X-Men because, you know, and it resonated with me on a lot of levels because one, it was like, you know, if you could only go to a place where all the things that made you different were celebrated and why you were awesome. But also it's like something during puberty that surfaces yeah. that your parents throw you out, you know, and it's one minority when you're gay that is different than, and by the way, uh, black people and Jewish people and other minorities have their whole separate set of journey that is different from the gay experience. But you never, when you're 16, go mom, dad, I'm black, I'm Jewish, and they go get the F out. Mm -hmm. So when you're gay, you have this inherent fear that you're going to lose all of your family, all of your friends, just like you experienced to, to that degree. Mm -hmm. um, and you're alone. And what X-Men did was what if there was a place where people were genetically the same as you mm -hmm. and all of those things that you were made you demonized by the rest of society mm -hmm. instead was why you're special. Dude, that's such a perfect example of like how I felt because I was I was so confused about how the things that I was taught about Jesus how I was rejected by the one place that is supposed to take me in and accepted by the people yeah that were supposed to put fear into my heart yeah and you and Carrie around me were the ones that protected me for the last 10 years of my life yeah more than anyone else that I know well thanks for that and um, look you know you have also taught me so much mm -hmm. you know the way you've carried yourself as you've been evolving as you continue to challenge yourself mm -hmm. um you know it, it's it's one of those things amazing to see because there's so many people that come to this town with so much talent but they don't have the drive mm -hmm. and the one thing that is more important than anything is the ability to get things done and the ability to push yourself and execute and make it happen so you know, it's 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 one of those things. Been amazing to watch you see, uh, see you grow and 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 flourish. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, and again, you remind me of that young 
Hugh Jackman walking in the door. Mm. And Hugh was a Broadway guy. You know, he was this guy who had done one TV show, which was called Corelli's Law, where he met his awesome wife, Deb, who is the coolest chick on the planet. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the studio was nervous because this guy had never carried a movie before. Nobody knew who he was. Um, and there were several times where they were like, we need to replace him. Mm. But Hugh dug deep, you know, and he, through sheer force of will, um, you know, to see him become that character that I used to pretend I was on my bicycle in New Jersey delivering my papers. And I would stick my hand out and I would like look at my shadow and I would pop my finger and I'd make the claw pop noise. Yeah. And to see this guy embody that heart and soul, you know. And the reason that movie is successful, look, there's when you're doing a film, there's two types of structure. There's the story structure where it's like, OK, you know, Magneto is going to build this machine. And just like the Emperor Constantine, when he converted to Christianity, all of the Christians stopped being persecuted in ancient Rome. Mm -hmm. um, so that was his mentality mm -hmm. um, was I'm going to convert all of the world leaders. And now when they go back, they're going to know what it's like to be us and they won't hate us anymore. Mm -hmm. But of course he was wrong. But yeah, the X-Men have to work together as a team and, you know, uh, Storm has to create a cyclone. Gene uses her telekinesis to help Logan get there. And then finally Cyclops knocks out Magneto so Wolverine can destroy the machine and stops the machine. That's the story. Mm -hmm. But the reason Hugh Jackman became a star, and this is the reason franchises are made, mm -hmm. this is the secret sauce is he is on the torch of that Statue of Liberty. And from the first frame you see him in the film, he is a man looking for a family. He's a man looking for people to love him and that he can love back. Mm -hmm. And he's found this little girl who can't touch anybody. And when he's holding Rogue, and why we set it up earlier in the movie, when he stabs her in the middle of the night, boom, she takes his power, boom, he heals, oh, everything's okay. And he pulls his glove off and he puts it on her, her face and it doesn't work and she's dead. And you see this guy who is the epitome of the alpha male crack. Mm -hmm. and that was when Hugh Jackman became a star because the audience fell in love with him. Mm -hmm. And when he's holding her and he knows all those wounds are gonna open up and then when that power transfer happens and he breathes in and he falls back and he's just bleeding out he was willing to sacrifice his life for that little girl. And that's mm -hmm. what family does. And that's what friends do. Mm -hmm. And that was when he became a star. And, you know, I think with the energy you have, you know, and I'm not saying this just, but I'm, I'm saying this because you have that same mojo, mm -hmm. you know? Thank you. And it's interesting because, you know, He's done a, such a great job with his career, mm -hmm. you know, and he's kept his integrity and his, and it's ama been amazing to watch, you know. Um, and there was an interesting story. So Hugh had auditioned, and I'll just tell you this, you can edit it out if you want, but Hugh had auditioned while he was in London playing Curly in Oklahoma. <laughs> so <laughs> I was actually going to ask you about yeah, this. So we get this VHS tape in. This was in the time of VHS tapes. Mm -hmm. So Fox had set up a casting thing in London. So there's a bunch of British actors and Hughes and Aussie who was over there working. And then we put it in. He's like, oh, he's pretty good, but he's not like I, all I had vision of was Russell Crowe. All yeah. I wanted was Russell Crowe. This was before Gladiator, but I had known Russell through his agent and met Russell a bunch of times. And I knew Russell was Russell was Wolverine to me. Mm -hmm. um, and so we saw that and then um, we ended up uh, Russell ended. we ended up sending Russell the script uh, and he did not want to do it. Um, for various reasons, which is a longer story and a funnier story. But I will uh, say then we hired Dugray Scott. Dugray Scott came in and Fox had an amazing relationship with Dugray because they just had a hit with him with Ever After. And this is how the studios work. The studios are desperate for younger leading male actors that they can hitch things to. So when it, as soon as somebody in that zeitgeist has a hit, they start to throw things at them. Sometimes people get thrown in the deep end of the pool too quickly like Taylor Lautner. Like Taylor Lautner, I think, 
would have been better served by being in a supporting role for a few more movies before throwing him into that John Singleton movie. Um, but what happened with, um, uh, where, where was I, what was I talking about? Hugh Jackman. Oh, Hugh Jackman. Process, yeah. Curly. So, uh, Hugh, then we hired Dugray Scott. Um, and then, um, we had pushed the movie till the fall because it, they were running behind on Mission Impossible 2. So, uh, they kept delaying and delaying. So finally I sent, um, our costume designer, Louise Mingenbach down to Australia and she calls me up and she is freaked out. And she's like, I'm like, Louise, what's wrong? She's like, you don't understand. Um, I, I, and this was before you could email a photo. Yeah. So she's like, I'm putting the, it's going to cost $800. I've taken a bunch of Polaroids. They're going to get to you tomorrow. It's by a direct courier service. So I'm like, okay, I signed off on it. Boom. So I get the photos of Dugray Scott the next day and Dugray had unfortunately fallen off a motorcycle and broken the ribs in his body. Oh my God. Trying to compete with Tom Cruise. First rule of doing a movie, do not try and compete with Tom Cruise. He is <laughs> from another planet. Um, and It's actually from Xenu. Yes. Um, and he had broken all the ribs in his body and his mm -hmm. he was just emaciated. And there was no way he was going to able, be able to recover in time. So we let Dugray go. And then we started the search again for another actor. Jesus. There was another actor who actually got an offer before Hugh did to play Wolverine. I won't say that actor's name. Um, oh, but we this was <laughs> a cash offer. And then the agent uh, stupidly wanted two and a half times what we were offering and turned the part down over that money. Mm. This, that was, this, again, this is a, a role that could be a game changer in that person's life. Um, and then we started looking at tapes again when that person, and then all of a sudden we see Hughes tape and, uh, Donna Isaacson, who was the head of Fox casting, sent the tape over and we said, we're already up in Toronto weeks away from shooting. Um, and we say, bring him in, you know? So Hugh flew, we're on day, actually we're on day three of shooting. We're shooting with Ian, I still remember this day, we're shooting with Ian McKellen, Bruce Davison, Senator Kelly, escaping from the prison when he mutated and falls into the water. Um, I think it was about day three. And Hugh Jackman comes in, and it is after a day of shooting, and we have no lead character. <laughs> And we have about 30 days before all of those scenes that we push at the end of the movie go one, 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 one. Um, and it's me holding the camera and it's on one of the DVDs and Brian's reading lines with Hugh and Hugh is just flat in it. Oh man. And it's one of those things where, you know, and it's so tough being an actor. It's why we bust our ass for so many years. So you guys can go in front of a, ca a camera and kill it is he was, Sometimes actors play defense. Yeah. Like, how do I not lose this part? I'm not going to do it. But you lose the energy of it. Yeah. So we did it a few times, and um, it just was a flat line. It just was not working. Mm -hmm. And then um, Brian's like, we need to find a lead actor. I have no lead actor for my movie. And we're like, you know, I'm like, so I'm like, I got to stay late and put together this list. And mm -hmm. so then uh, Kevin Feige, who was an assistant, um, to that's, one of the producers at the time, <laughs> knocks on the door. He's like, "Hey, do you want to go to dinner with this guy?" Mm -hmm. And I'm like, "Kev, no, I can't. I gotta, you know, I gotta put together this list. We don't have a lead actor." He's like, well, "You gotta eat anyway." And he's like, "And I'm like, yeah, you're right." So it was me, Kevin, uh, and Hugh Jackman go to this restaurant at the Four Seasons in Toronto because the studio was paying for it. Um, <laughs> uh, anyone out there? The studio pays for everything. It's an awesome job. Yes. Um, and he just loosened right off. offs, right offs, right offs. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Skyboxes, <laughs> staples, Skyboxes, yep. Center, all the stuff I was complaining about. Yep, earlier. yeah. <laughs> uh, it should still be bullshit, but yeah. Um, and Hugh just lightened up, mm -hmm. and he was Hugh Jackman. And I remember turning to Kevin after Hugh left. He went upstairs to his room, and uh, I said, "Are you thinking what I'm thinking?" And he's like, "Yeah." And I said, "This is the guy." Hmm. And I'm like, when does his plane leave? And he's like, 6 a.m. And I'm like, and it was already like 11.30 and I knew we had a early call and I'm like, I can't talk to Brian, I have to wait till. So Hugh Jackman gets on a plane, flies back to Los Angeles. Australia. Los Angeles. Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah right, He's right, flying right. back to LA. Yeah. Um, 
and probably somewhere mid-flight, probably he's probably over like maybe Colorado, um, the decision is made because I talked to Brian <laughs> and um, he says, all right, let's do a real test. Uh, and that day we were shooting the Senate scene in the hallway with Magneto and Xavier with Patrick and Ian. And um, we set up two scenes. One was a scene with him being examined by Jean Grey. Mm-hmm. And the other one was the the scene in the truck with Rogue, with Anna Paquin. And both actresses came in and Hugh Jackman took his bags off, got on the next plane back to Toronto. Um, and we shot that scene. And a security guard came up to Brian and said, hey, is that the guy playing Wolverine? And Brian looks at him and says, yep, that's the guy playing Wolverine. Wow. And that was how Hugh Jackman got hired. That's so crazy that it was this close like, it was and he it, it was two auditions one he had flown back mm-hmm. um and he didn't have the job you know yeah uh, and can you imagine that movie without hugh jackman you know? how old was he hugh jackman was 30 30 i think about to be 31 wow so he's right at 30 it's two years away from me yeah gives people hope yeah. too like because was that the biggest changing point in his career Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean that. Like he hadn't done anything. You know, like that. a lot of actors, they give up on their dream before. Mm-hmm. You know, you could have a huge hit at thirty. Yeah. yeah, you know. But he'd also been busting his ass. You know, he was Gaston in Beauty and the Beast. He was Curly in Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. You know, he had done. But this was his first, like, film where he's like the guy. Um, and then fear takes over, and the studio starts getting dailies in, and they're like, "We're not sure." And you know, there was a day where the studio wanted to replace him. And, um, and Hugh just, you know, and Hugh, honestly, when I look back at the dailies studio was always wrong, you know? Mm. Um, but Hugh just turned it up that notch when he needed to. Um, and he would do little rituals. Like he would take cold showers in the morning to get into Wolverine mode. And, uh, Feel that. yeah. And one of the magic things too, about shooting a movie on location is like you get, you hang out a lot. So Ian McKellen would throw these crazy dinner parties and, you know, um, Fomka Jansen and, and Anna Paquin taught me how to ice skate. And uh, you're just doing everything together with the group. Um, and still That's why to so many day. affairs happen on movie sets. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Totally yeah. true. Um, <laughs> yes. It's a bunch of young, in shape people who are, it's like the Olympics. It's like the Olympics of art. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, although nothing's like the Olympics. I hear they go through like, a billion condoms at the Olympics, <laughs> as they should. Uh, well, I, I actually wanted to actually kind of wrap that into something that, you know, had happened recently in my life is the man from Toronto. Yeah. Um, and this is probably where we're, we've gone into a long podcast. I hope everybody's still still awake and popping because this has been some juicy content. But, you know, I, I, had, I had called you and I won't say what series it was, but I had booked a TV show. And I sat down, and it was the night of the Oscars, and I remember I made a list, and it was the pros and cons. And you sat there, and you are like, here's the pros, and here's the cons. And I made my own pros and cons. And then I yep. called my agent, my lawyer, my publicist, my manager, my mom, my dad, my, you know, Jesus. Yep. And I woke up the next day, and it was 30 minutes before I was supposed to go to the test, and I turned down that role. And it was a lot of money for a long time, yep. but in a role that I was just not going to be happy with. Yep. And it, it wasn't a story I wanted to tell. And then it came down to the line for this other audition. And I went out for it and it was in the midst of, I had 18 others that week when I was like blown out of the water. And I just, I hit this last audition and I absolutely crushed it and I had a blast with it. And I never heard anything back from it again mm. for like a week. And then I called my manager and he's like, oh, dude, they, they loved you. They sent their tape off to producers. And I was like, oh, fuck yeah, that's great. That's a great audition. And then that tape went to executives and then studio heads and then the director. And at that point, I had called you and I said, Tom, I, I don't stand a chance. I mean, I do. Like I sent, we sent in apparently a good tape. But I know if I'm competing against guys my age range, the Miles Tellers, the... Zach Efron's, then I have no you know, toe in the water at this point. Would you, would you put in a good word if you know anybody over there? Yeah. And, and you did. Yes. And that was like, that was such a pivotal moment. This is a pivotal moment in my career and I'm like capsulating it. Yeah. What if he was just like, nah, man. <laughs> <laughs> hey, fuck out of here. <laughs> no, look, I, I but get. Wh- why was that? 
You know, look, I, I, um, uh, I get asked a lot to, Hey, would you do a call? Would you introduce, you know, or, or put in a good word? And, um, I don't say yes a lot, but I see in you, like I said before, a lot mm -hmm. of the same things that I see in, I saw in Hugh Jackman when he walked in the door. Yeah. You know, you have this accessibility to you. Um, but you have this like, you know, energy that is very much like if I was going to go to Hasbro and say, all right, here are the designs for a Hollywood leading man. Could you just put this in the computer and make a bunch of action figures? Um, they would look like you and you. you, you, and you <laughs> Thanks. Um, but what you don't get sometimes is that empathy. And I'm going to go back to that word, you know, and that's the key to an actor. You know, if you can make somebody laugh or cry or feel angry or uh, sad or happy, you know, that's the key. There's so many modely looking people who don't have that gift, you know. Um, and when you look at the people who do succeed in this business, um, it's the people who make you care. You know, it's, those are my favorite actors, whether it's Jack Nicholson, you know, um, or DiCaprio, um, you know, it's one of those things where I think you have that crazy potential. And also mm -hmm. I know your journey of, look, whenever an actor comes in the door, everybody on the other side of the table wants them to kill it. We have 80 other things we need to do that day. Yeah. We just want to say, all right, that part. And we are your biggest cheerleaders. But the number one thing we want out of that person is that empathy and this sense of fearlessness. Mm -hmm. And I think you have both of those things. You know, I could see you doing a Will Ferrell comedy or a Borat 2 as well as, um, you know, digging deep and doing some Oscar caliber work down the road. Um, and that ability to run the spectrum of human emotion is why people go to the movies. Yeah. So, and that's all the compliments I'm going to pay you for the rest Dude, of the day. Dude, I, I like, it's it's humbling, man, to hear that from you. Like, I just. Just I don't, don't F it up. Yeah. This is your big shot. Yeah, no pressure, kid. <laughs> yep. Yep. I better uh, not get a call from Kevin Hart going, what, who the hell is this guy? <laughs> Woody Harrelson calls yeah. like, what the fuck is going on? By the way, what, weed. <laughs> what two more epic actors to be working with? You yeah, know? my first um, major theatrical movie. Dude, yeah, you've, you know what, you've, you've earned it. You've yeah. earned your place at the table. Um, mm -hmm. Just, you know, always remember, you know, there's an old saying in, in, with people in power. You never judge them on the way to them getting power. You judge them after they get power. Yeah. So if you become a dick, I'm going to come for you with a, a big baseball bat and I'm going to wear my Batman outfit. So that's true. He's chewed me out before. Yes, so it's, it's, it's and I'll bring his X-Men Wolverine claws, claws, claws. right up behind him. <laughs> We're going to tag team you. Yeah. You guys, this is not been... in that way. <laughs> Wait, Except maybe in I that mean, dream maybe. I had. But. You know, that was a one dream that one yeah. place th stream threesome. Yeah, stream threesome. That's a, that was a song about us. Yes. Um, you guys, thank you so much for this conversation. Like this, ditto has been me go. wildly enlightening. Um, where can people find more information about um, masks and uh, yes. what the benefits? So of um, we put together a website which gives you only scientific information and data. There are no opinions, no politics on there. It is just this is the science behind wearing a mask or whatever other campaigns we're going to do. And it's at facts to health. So it's the word facts, F A C T S the number two and then health H E A L T H dot org. Um, foolproof foolproof. Um, and yeah, the idea was to sort of activate Hollywood and now we're actually reaching out larger because we're uh, activating the whole creative community around the internet mm -hmm. to use your voice to help people stay safe and to make a better planet. And you know, look, this, this is one of those things where we're gonna be doing a mental health campaign next mm -hmm. um, because there's a lot of people suffering from depression. So all I'm gonna say as, as we leave is, you know, if there's somebody you're thinking about who might be alone, who might be a little bit cut off and feeling a little separated because of COVID, um, give them a call. Yeah. 
just reach out, um, FaceTime them. If you don't feel comfortable seeing face to face, just um, let them hear your voice. Yeah, and that'll that'll go a huge way. Yeah, absolutely. Mark, any final closing comments? I got nothing. <laughs> Great conversation though. Yeah, come on, Mark, give us something. Come on. You can find me at the golf course writing off my taxes. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah, brother. Keep writing it off while it's still alive. Because um, if I become president, it's all going away. I, I want to ask one final th thought and statement is what would you say to the dreamers that want to tell stories? I would say, look, the, the most important thing, it's why I love Los Angeles. You know, mm -hmm. uh, Los Angeles is where all of the dreamers move to live. Yeah. And it's a hard decision and you, it takes a lot of balls to pack up your crap and uh, leave your family and friends and the safety of your little bubble and move out here. Mm -hmm. But I respect everybody that goes for that dream. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing you have to decide is like, you know, I knew I could live with failing. What was gonna haunt me was if I didn't try. Mm -hmm. So if you have that dream, if that thing is in your gut, go for it, make some great chapters in the book of your life um, and give it 100% uh, because your boss is your future 80 year old you and you don't want that old person coming back with a DeLorean time machine and a baseball bat <laughs> to hit you right now because you didn't chase that dream. Yeah. So done and done you guys thank you so much for listening uh facts health.org you can also go check out uh my video that i made because of tom uh with tyler and it's a video about heroes wearing masks i challenge all of you to do the same thing post on socials tag me i will shout you out in the vlogs and on the pod if you guys do that so will tom he doesn't have a vlog or a pod but yes i am social media free because i know <laughs> uh but hashtag it heroes wear masks yeah and uh, thank you, Pearson. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. You're my hero now. Yes. 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 <laughs> and to all the dreamers out there, go fucking do it. That's Carpe it. diem. Just do it. Just do it. Nike. Sponsor. Nike. Yes. Sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> Bye.